Hello, St. Mark's High School, freshmen and sophomores. My name is Bob Perrin, and I was supposed to be with you. I was supposed to be with you in Wilmington, Delaware, but you know, with all of the changes going on, it made no sense for any of us to travel or be together. So today, we are gonna be doing this retreat virtually. I know it's not the same. I know that in some ways this has probably been crazy and you're ready to get out of the house. I know that I'm pretty tired of being home as well. But you know, during these times, it's important that we still focus on those things that are important in our lives. And this retreat is one of those important things. So we're gonna spend some time today um, just praying together and maybe learning together, laughing together, I hope, um, and it's going to be okay. It's going to be a good day. So, um, family is important to me. Family is so critical to who we are. And today, actually, the theme that I'm supposed to be talking about is community, which seems weird, right? Because we're all stuck right now at home looking at our little computer monitors or our phones or whatever device you're looking at this on. Um, the reality is community um, is kind of taking a hit right now with all of our social distancing. And um, I'm pretty sure my community of my family is ready for us to just get out and do um, some other things and to be with their friends and to be with other people than mom and mom and dad. But um, um, today we are going to talk about community and the importance of community and living out our faith. Because here's the reality. We were not created to do this alone. You know, when you look in scripture, Jesus didn't send people out by themselves to do ministry. They were always sent out together with other people. They were sent out, in many cases, two by two, it says in scripture. So today we're going to talk about some key reasons why community is important. But before we do that, I would like to take a moment for us just to pray just to take a moment and start with prayer today. Now, for some of you, prayer may be a difficult thing. Maybe maybe it isn't, maybe it is. Um, maybe it's easy for you to take time to pray. I know for me, sometimes it's hard to stop and just pray. But I take a lot of consolation in the fact that that has been true for many people that I believe are probably holier than me. As a matter of fact, I'd like to start with a video by somebody that we know was pretty holy. So holy that she was named a saint. And she struggled with taking time to pray. Listen to this video before we pray. Because she really lays out what prayer is and why prayer is so important. God speaks in the silence of the heart and we listen and then we speak to God from the fullness of our heart. First we listen, God speaks and then we speak and God listens. And that connection is in his prayer, is oneness with God. Fruit of prayer is deepening of faith. And the fruit of faith is love. And the fruit of love is service. And the fruit of service is peace. That's why we need to pray to have a clean heart. And if we have a clean heart, we can see God. And if we see God naturally, we begin to love one another. That means we see and we look and then we give our hands to serve and our hearts to love. And that's the beginning of holiness. And we begin in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, today I entrust this day to you. I ask, Lord, that you keep all of us safe that you help us in these crazy, crazy times to stay focused on you. As we celebrate together in this Easter season, Lord, we know that you have victory over death, 
that you call us to you, that you save us, and that you call us to be with you. Lord, we thank you and we praise you um, today, and we ask Mary's um, intercessions on this retreat as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hours of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So like I said, my name is Bob Perrin. I'm actually the executive director of a place called JMJ Pregnancy Center in Orlando, Florida. And um, yeah, it's beautiful here right now. This is a great time of the year. And um, let me tell you a little bit about my posse, my crew, my family. Um, I am married. I've been married to my wife, Lisa, for 33 years. And I have five children. Um, three of my children are adopted. Two of my kids are homegrown. So my oldest now is already 30 years old and my youngest is 14. So she's about the same age as some of some of you. So that's a little bit about my family. But I started doing ministry um, because people thought that I looked like Curly from the Three Stooges. And I started a thing called Stooge for Christ Ministry, which was an acronym for Strive Toward Obeying Our God Every Day. And that's really how I've tried to live my life. But um, really it was because I suffer from a disease um, that I like to call parental brain damage. Now, I'm guessing after spending maybe for some of you weeks at home with your mom and dad, you know exactly what I mean when I say parental brain damage. But for those of you who do not, um, I'll give you a couple of examples. I have a son, his name's Isaiah. We adopted Isaiah from Korea when he was 18 months old. And I am telling you what, he was the cutest little 18 month old Korean boy you have ever seen in your life. And everybody loved Isaiah. They thought he was so cute because he had this really unique voice. He kind of sounded like Mr. Miyagi from The Karate Kid. So if you said hello to my son, he would say, hello. Let's just like that, hello. I am Isaiah. Until he turned about two years old. And one day when you um, went out, we went up to him and said, Hey, buddy, how you doing? He's like, hello, I am Spider-Man. And we couldn't call him anything else. If I said, hey, Isaiah, come here, he would look at me and say, I do not know Isaiah. I am Spider-Man. Now, at the time, I was running a camp in Iowa. We had around 1,800 students come to this camp every year, and they absolutely loved my family, especially Isaiah. So one day, I'm walking through the dining hall, and I notice that these girls kind of have Isaiah surrounded. And I heard one of the girls say, hey, buddy, what's your name? And he says, I am Spider-Man. And they all giggled. They thought it was really funny. And one of them said, no, 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 no. What's your real name? And he says, I am Spider-Man. And they laughed again. And one of them got down on her knees and said, please, please, please tell us your name. And my son went like this. Shh. I and Peter Parker. Now that gives you an idea of my son. And that's what I mean by parental brain damage. Every one of my kids gave it one last story and it's gonna lead into what we're talking about with community. When Mackenzie um, was about two or two and a half years old, she loved going to church more than any kid I've ever known. She had to get dressed up for church. She would wear her little Beauty and the Beast dress she had to wear her patent leather shoes and she wanted to wear pigtails, which was funny because her hair was only about this long. So she looked like the devil, okay? But she would get to church and she would be like this. You know what that means? It means let the games begin because she loved climbing around and saying hello to everybody. And she especially loved those things down on the ground. Now, I know it's been a while, maybe for some of you that you've been able to go to church, but you know what I'm talking about, right? You know what those are called? Well, in Iowa, they were called 
her pony, okay? She would get on her pony and be like, yeah, yeah, like, no, sit down. What are you doing? She was so loud and so obnoxious in church. She didn't mean to be bad. She was just like a, a two-year-old, right? She was just all over the place till finally one day I had a moment. I sat her down next to me and I said, look, Father is getting ready to put Jesus in the tabernacle. And she looked at me with this really weird face and she says, what's a tabernacle? I said, a tabernacle is that gold box. Father's gonna put Jesus in that gold box. And her eyes got really big and she said, they're gonna put Jesus in a box. I'm like, yes, he likes to be in that box. Okay, now that's not maybe great theology, but she was a young little kid, right? So I sat her down next to me. She stared up at that box, the tabernacle. And I thought, parent of the year. I went to turn to my wife to brag a little bit because we never were able to get my daughter quiet in church. And without any warning, my daughter jumped up onto her pony and screamed at the top of her lungs, don't worry, Jesus, I'll get you out of there. Everybody in the church started laughing. My pastor, Father Pat, he stood up and he went like this, let us, and he had to go to the sacristy because he was laughing so hard, right? He's like, finally, he ends mass. And I'm thinking, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna strangle my daughter. But I realized that day my daughter wasn't trying to be bad at church. She was just being a little kid. She loved Jesus and her friend Jesus was real to her. And so she wanted to put Jesus, get Jesus out of that box. Now I know that sounds crazy and maybe a little funny, but the reality is her faith was so strong. She had childlike faith. As we begin this session, I want to think a little bit about that childlike faith. Because you know what? Little kids understand some really important things. Little kids just trust. Little kids know that they need other people, that they need community. They know that they need their mom and dad to come and take care of them, to feed them, to help them. They know that they need friends to be around, that they like being around people, um, and that they learn from that. Little kids also don't have all of the things that hold them back because they're worried that they're going to make a mistake or that they're not going to look cool. They just do what they do. They're little kids, right? I've never met a little kid that didn't think they were a good artist or a good singer because they just know that they're gifted and they're going to share that gift. Well, we are going to learn a lot today, I think, from that. Because the reality is community helps us know who we are when we find the right community to be around. When we find the right friends, we will find those friends help us to grow. They help us to learn who we are and they help us to be the best versions of ourselves. You know, community helps us to be our real selves because we know that we can put up masks, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about. Because we have our Instagram self and our real self. Our Instagram self and our real self. Our Instagram self and our real self. Our Instagram, how we look when we wake up in the morning and our real self. You get the message, right? You get it that sometimes we put up these, these things, these, these images of ourselves. We just want people to see a certain part of us. But our real community, our real friends accept us for who we are. We need to find those people in our lives. As freshmen and sophomores, you're learning a lot about yourself right now. You're learning what you like, what you don't like. And you can have friends that can help lift you up or you can have friends that can bring you down. And I challenge you to find that group that will help lift you up, who will challenge you when you need challenged, and will help you to see the person that God created you to be. Community is core to who we are, right? We, most of us, 
grew up in some kind of community with a mom or a dad or an uncle or an aunt or grandparents. And actually family is our first community. And our first community teaches us some of the most valuable lessons about being in community together. As a matter of fact, when my son, Bobby, um, Bobby is my oldest son. And when he was about eight years old, Bobby um, was getting, we were getting ready for Christmas. And I said to Bobby, Bobby, what do you want this year for Christmas? Now, think about all the things you wanted as an eight-year-old, right? I mean, like a scooter, a bike, maybe you wanted some kind of video game. Um, you know, I can think of lots and lots of things that I wanted when I was a kid that was eight years old. But my son Bobby looked at me and he said, Dad, I think I want a tuxedo. What? Eight-year-old kid wants a tuxedo, right? So I said, Bobby, why, why do you want a tuxedo? I mean, come on, man. We can't play you at the tuxedo. And he's like, Dad, I don't know if you've noticed this, but Mom, she's pretty awesome. She helps me make my bed in the morning. She helps me. She fixes food for me. She helps me with school. Dad, Mom is always there for me. And I want to take Mom out to dinner to tell her thanks. And dad, I got nothing to wear. I told my wife this story and guess what my son got for Christmas? Yeah, you got it, he got a tuxedo. And a little bit after um, that, that day, um, after Christmas, we were at the barber shop and my son's looking in the mirror and he's like, dad, I look good. He says, I think we should take mom. I should take mom out to dinner tonight. So I said, all right, buddy. I called Lisa. She was out running around doing some stuff with the girls. So we got his, we got his tuxedo on and he said, dad, should I pay for mom's dinner? And I said, that's a good idea. And he went like this. So I gave him some money and he says, dad, I noticed that mom likes it when, when you buy her flowers. Should I buy mom some flowers? I'm like, that's a good idea, buddy. So we drove to our local florist. I gave him $10. He had his tuxedo on. He walks in and he says, hi, my name is Bobby Perrin and my mom is the greatest mom in the whole wide world. And I'm gonna take her out to dinner tonight. How much can I get for this much money? I have never seen so many flowers for $10 in my life. My son asked me a whole bunch more questions. You know, should I open the door for mom? You know, things like that. And finally, we got ready and he got to the door and he knocked on the door. And my wife opens the door and took one look at my son. And guess what she did? You got it. She started to cry. And I'm like, come on, man. I've been doing this all afternoon, getting him ready. Now she has to go fix her makeup, get ready to go. So she got ready and finally they're ready to leave and I'm waving goodbye. And I see them going to the car. And all of a sudden my son comes running back in. So I say, hey buddy, come here, what's going on? And he says, dad, I got to tell you something. I'm like, yeah, what do you need? And he says, dad, Thanks for teaching me how to be a man. I'm not going to lie. Then I cried, right? Because the reality is, my son does learn a lot of lessons from me. Sometimes good, sometimes not so good. But our kids are always watching and we learn the most important and most valuable lessons of life from those people in our life who are around us and love us the most. The second thing that community helps us do is community helps us to dream. Community helps us to really live like the person that God created us to be. So dreaming is something that's important, learning what you like, who you are, what you wanna do. There's this, this doctor named Dr. Howard Thurman. You've probably never heard of him unless you're a history geek. But Dr. Howard Thurman is a pretty important pick, um, person in our United States history because he was somebody who ministered to um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. 
He was somebody who inspired him. And he has many quotes that I love. One of my favorite quotes is, don't ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive and do it. Because what the world needs is people who can come alive. Who are those people in your life? Who are those people that help motivate you, excite you, get you ready to go out and do great things in the world? Those are the people that you need to form community with. Because you see, it is important that we live that out. He also has a quote that haunts me. And I think it can haunt many of us because there's so much reality to this quote. He said this, imagine if you will, being on your deathbed and standing around you are all of the ghosts of the ideas, the abilities, the talents, the gifts, the dreams given to you by God, that you, for whatever reason, never pursued those dreams. You ne never did anything with those ideas. You never used those talents. You never used those gifts. You never took advantage of those opportunities. And there they are, standing around your bed, looking at you before you take your last dying breath looking at you with angry eyes saying, we came to you and only you could have given us life. And now we must die with you forever. God has given you unique gifts, unique talents, unique dreams, unique things that you can do with your life. That if you don't do them, they die with you. Who are those people in your lives who do you surround yourself with that can help you live out those dreams, realize those dreams? Because God has great plans for you. God has put something in you that he's put in no one else. What is that? Is it, mu is it a musical gift? Are you a songwriter? Are you a writer? Are you a great athlete? Are you a person that people come to when they need help? because you have a, a, an ability to listen and have empathy? Are you intelligent? Do you use your intelligence um, in science or math or whatever subject that you are good at to truly make the people and world around you better? What gift did he give you? And maybe some of you, like I would, be, would have been, are sitting here thinking, man, Mr. Bob, you don't know me. I don't have any gifts. I guarantee you, you have gifts. I guarantee you that you have a uniqueness. It may just be weirdness. Use that weirdness. I have this friend named Chris Paget, one of the weirdest, funniest guys I know. He uses that weirdness to minister to people around the world. What gift did God give you? Are you that class clown that's always in trouble making jokes? Well, maybe someday you'll be the next Chris Paget. No, better yet, maybe someday you'll be the best you. That's all I'm saying about this. So the second thing is our friends and our community help us dream. The last thing I want to talk about is how community helps us to trust God more. Because you see, we surround ourselves with people who teach us about ourselves. But God in particular wants to have that relationship of trust with you, for him to trust, or for you to trust him. God is with you even when you don't know it. Some of you right now maybe have a great relationship with God, and some of you don't trust God with any of the big decisions in your life. Maybe he's just like the wallpaper on the wall. You know God's there, but you don't really think about him that often. You know, my wife and I have learned a lot about trust over the years. Because you see, when we got married, we were sure we were going to have lots and lots of kids. And it turned out that that was not God's plan for us because we found out we couldn't have kids. And it made me very angry. I remember thinking, God, if you love me so much, how? How can this be that something I want so deeply you're taking away? And I struggle with that. And my wife struggled with it way more than I did. 
You see, because after we got married, we moved from our hometown of Kansas City, Topeka, Kansas area, to Colorado, which we loved Colorado, but we had no friends. We had just moved there. We were just learning to meet people. And that's when we found this news. So not only were we struggling with this, we didn't have any family or friends to really help us, just one another. And it was a really tough time. And it could have been a horrible time. But luckily, we had people praying for us. As a matter of fact, I will promise you this. If you're going through a struggle right now, which could very well be, we all have struggles. If you have someone praying for you, um, it's going to be okay. I can promise you if you have somebody praying for you, God is already listening. My mother and father-in-law were those people for us. And they went to Oklahoma to this shrine called the Infant Jesus of Prague. Now, I know some of you are thinking it's Prague, Bob, you aren't saying it right. But I have been to this shrine. And that little old lady in Oklahoma made it very clear. There is an infant Jesus of Prague, but right here we call it the infant Jesus of Prague. So there you go. Well, they went there and put a prayer request in for my wife and I, and we didn't even know it. Shortly after that prayer, I got a call from a friend of mine, a priest, who asked me to consider a job back in Kansas City. I took that job and started as a youth minister in a parish that hadn't even built a church yet. It wasn't long, maybe a couple weeks, before one day I had a knock on the door of my office and it was a guy that changed my life forever. He was a guy in our parish. I'd never met him before. He was a doctor. And he came in and he said, hey, I just want to ask you a question. And this may sound very weird. But I have a friend, he's a doctor in Missouri, and he um, was really disturbed today because he has this young lady that came in and is pregnant. And at the last minute, she's deciding to put her baby up for adoption. So he asked me to pray for her and for her baby. And so I went to um, our sister church and I sat in adoration for about an hour. And the whole time I was praying, your name kept coming up, which is weird because we'd never met. And he said, so I kept praying and your name kept coming up. And so finally I said, okay, I get it. So I'm here to ask you a really weird question. Are you and your wife interested in adopting a child? That is all that we had thought about for months and years. It was so amazing that God placed this man in our life. Of course, I said yes. I couldn't hardly speak. And a couple of short months later, we drove to Joplin, Missouri, where we picked up, um, went to the hospital and picked up and met my daughter and held my daughter for the first time. As I looked at that little girl, all I could think is how much I loved her. I had just met her, but somehow I knew that she was different than any other baby I'd ever met. I knew that she was mine, that she was my child. And I thought to myself, God, how can you love me this much? But he did. And in that moment, I felt that love. And all of the things I had wanted had gone away because there my baby was. And as we were driving home, my wife read letters from our, um, from our birth mom and her family. And we read one letter from our birth mom's mom, her grandmother. And she said, I want you to know my daughter. She was a beautiful young woman. She was a senior in high school. Um, she was involved in church. She was a lector. She sang in the choir. She was involved in youth ministry. And on prom, she made a decision that changed her life forever. She said, my daughter knew she couldn't abort this child, but she went back and forth. Do I keep this baby or do I put this baby up for adoption? She said, finally, I decided to drive to Oklahoma to put a prayer request in for my daughter to have peace. And it turns out that she was there right around the time my mother and father-in-law was there 
putting a prayer request in for us. See, I believe in a God who can take a couple from Colorado, move them to Kansas so that they can adopt a baby from Missouri that was meant to be their child from the beginning of time. That is a God worthy of my trust. And you see, I learned that day how important it is to trust God. And I know that every day you wake up and you have moments where you trust and you don't trust. But I promise if you let God in and trust him, he, he will not let you down. Okay, so it's hard to do, I know. So I'm going to teach you a couple things that I've learned about um, trusting God. Two actual prayers that I've found that have helped. First is called the doorway prayer. Now, some of you have probably never heard of this. I'm pretty sure the priest that was my spiritual director probably made it up. I don't know. But it was the greatest prayer I've ever learned, other than the Our Father, of course. Okay, maybe the Hail Mary. Um, but he said, Bob, here's the prayer. It's simple. Whenever you go through a door, thank God. You walk through a door, thank God for the food you had that day. You walk through another door, you thank God for your parents. You walk through another door, you thank God that you um, are alive today. He said, I can promise you two things. Number one, you go through way more doors in a day than you'll ever imagine. And number two, no matter how many doors you go through, you will not run out of things to be thankful for. I have found that to be so true. When you begin seeing God in those little things, in those little moments, it's easier to trust God with the bigger things. The second thing I've learned, the second kind of prayer is silent prayer. Now that one's a lot harder. It's hard in this culture to be silent, to take the earbuds out, to turn off the music, the games, the noise, and just to be silent. But Father Keating, um, the founder of the contemplative movement, put it like this. Silence is the language of God. Everything else is a poor translation. When we sit silent and listen to God, we hear deeply inside of us God speaking to us. What I found when I started doing that is my silent time of the day became some of my loudest time. Not externally, but internally. As I sat quiet and just said, God, please speak to me. I started remembering things that I had forgotten during the day. I started thinking about conversations I had. I started remembering things like embarrassment in retrospect. And if you don't know what that is, that is when you should have been embarrassed, but you were too stupid to know you should be embarrassed. When we sit in those silent moments, it allows God to enter into the conversation. Now, Father Keating said it great. My grandmother um, had a way more simpler approach. She always told me when I was growing up, Bobby, because that's what she called me, Bobby, God gave you two ears and one mouth for a reason. You're supposed to listen twice as much as you talk. We definitely don't do that with our prayer life sometimes. Sometimes we just need to be quiet and let God speak to us. So community, we learn about ourselves. We learn a little bit how to dream um, and be the best version of ourselves. And through community, we learn to trust. I wanna end with one last story. And it's a story about community that's maybe a little bit different. It's a story about how community can transform us and change us. You see, when I started out as a youth minister, I had it all figured out. I knew exactly how God had called me to be a youth minister. I had my theological training. I knew the answers, or so I thought. I was very wrong. And I learned that lesson from a young man named JJ, who was a freshman in high school. At the time, um, I was responsible for confirmation. It was my very first year. I thought I had everything figured out. And the first night of confirmation, 
I met JJ. To give you a physical description, JJ had long blonde hair that came down to the middle of his back. JJ always had on a Metallica t-shirt. Many of you maybe don't know who Metallica is, but it was a heavy metal band at the time. Um, they were usually three quarter length sleeves and JJ came walking in to the building. I watched him through the windows and he was finishing off a joint. That's not how you want to go into a confirmation class. It's illegal and wrong and it shouldn't be done. And um, I'm thinking, what am I going to do? I got to kick this kid out. So I called him over and said, were you just smoking? And he's like, yeah. I'm like, well, you know, you can't do that. Okay. And I said, well, I got to send you home. Good. I don't want to be here. So I called his mom and I sent him home. The next week, his mom forced him to come to confirmation class again. And he was horrible. I smelled marijuana on him, but I didn't see him smoking. So I let him stay. And at the end of class, I caught him by the dumpster, finishing off a six pack of beer. And I called his mom and I sent him home. And I went into my pastor the next day and I said, Father Owen, I have this kid who is a mess. He needs to get kicked out of confirmation. So I'm gonna kick him out. And Father Owen said, you can't kick him out. I'm like, that's a stupid thing. Why can't I kick him out? You just heard what he did. He says, Bob, you can't kick anybody out of confirmation. So I was like, fine, and I left. The next week he showed up to class again, and he was horrible. And the next week, and the next week, and the next week. And every single week I went into Father Owen, and I said, I gotta kick this kid out. And every single week, Father Owen told me I couldn't. Till finally I had had it. And I went into his office and I said, Father Owen, either I kick JJ out of confirmation or I quit. And Father Owen got up from behind his desk and he went um, over by the side of me and put his arm around me. And he took me to this crucifix in his office. And he said, you see that cross? I said, yes, Father. He says, you see that? I said, yes. He said, Jesus died on that cross. I said, yes, I know, Father. He says, no, 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 you don't know. He said, Jesus died on that cross. And when Jesus died on that cross, I believe with all of my heart that Jesus died on that cross for my sins. I said, yes, I, I, I agree with that, Father. He says, Bob, do you also believe that when Jesus died on that cross, he died for your sins? And I said, of course, Father, of course I do. And he says, Bob, when Jesus died on that cross, he was thinking of J.J., and if J.J. was good enough for Jesus, he better be good enough for you. Now get out of my office. Well, that was the last time I brought J.J. up to Father Owen. But shortly after that, we went on a retreat. And on this retreat, we had um, a big open campus. It was a beautiful retreat center. And during breakfast, I looked out in the woods and there JJ was smoking a joint. So I called him in and I said, look, I can't kick you out of confirmation, but I can't kick you off of this retreat. And I called his mom. And about 45 minutes later, his mom finally showed up. And as soon as she walked in, before I could say anything, he said, mom, you're going to be so mad at me. And I thought to myself, of course, she's going to be mad. It takes a special kind of stupid to smoke a joint on a retreat. But before I could say anything, he pulled up the sleeves on his Metallica t-shirt. And he said, Mom, I am an addict. And if I don't get help, I am going to die. And he showed her all of the track marks on his arms. She didn't look at him and say, you horrible, rotten kid. How could you do this? She just hugged her son. She hugged her son and told him she loved him. And they left and he went off to treatment. And he spent the rest of that semester in treatment. And the next year he started confirmation all over again. JJ looked no different the second time. He had long blonde hair down to the middle of his back, a Metallica t-shirt every time I saw him. 
But now he was carrying this Bible with him. And every time I saw him, he was reading that Bible. I thought, that's really cool. And one day I even said, why are you reading that all the time, JJ? That's pretty amazing. And he said, dude, you have to understand something. I am an addict. And whenever I think about doing drugs, I read the Bible instead. So I read the Bible all the time. I saw JJ go through confirmation differently that year. He still was obnoxious sometimes. He still was very, um, very obnoxious. But I watched other young people see the change in him and I saw the change in him to the point when it became time for confirmation, I said, who wants to read the readings at mass? And the only person to raise their hand was JJ. And I said, JJ, you can do it, but you gotta dress up. He said, sweet dude, I'm there. He said, I'm gonna do it, I'll do it, I'll dress up. So I said, okay. He showed up for confirmation with his hair pulled back into a ponytail to reveal a long dangly cross earring in his ear. He had on a blue blazer, khaki slacks, and a Metallica t-shirt. So I went to tell him that he had to change his t-shirt, but he beat me to the sacristy. And as I walked into the sacristy, I had seen that he had already connected with Bishop Hannafin. And he walked in and was like, Bishop Hannafin, dude, what's up? And I watched Bishop Hannafin go, hello. And JJ said the funniest thing I've ever seen or heard said to a bishop. He said, Bishop, dude, I have a question for you. Have you ever like read the Bible? That's pretty funny, but the bishop um, immediately was like, well, of course, yes, JJ, I have. JJ said, sweet dude, so have I. Three times, cover to cover. He said, Bishop, what's your favorite verse? And like that, the bishop had a verse. It was amazing. And then the bishop said, JJ, what's your favorite verse? And he took out this old tattered Bible and he flipped it to the story of the shepherd that had a hundred sheep. And one of those sheep had gotten lost. And the shepherd left the 99 and went after that one sheep. He got done reading that story and he put his Bible back in his pocket and he looked at the bishop with his eyes now welled up with tears and he said, Bishop, I am that sheep. I don't think I've seen a holier moment in our church than at that moment when our shepherd, the bishop of our diocese, stood there crying with this young man because he got it. He was about as lost as he could be. And God took him and transformed him and changed him. God did the work, not me, not Father Owen, not the bishop, not any of the students in the class. God took JJ, this child that he loved so much. And when JJ turned to him, he reached around and he grabbed him and he held on. And he let J.J. know how much he was loved. God transformed him and made him a new person. You see, we are in the Easter season. We have just celebrated that cycle of Lent where we look at our weaknesses. We look at the areas where our lives need to be transformed. And God calls us back to him. God calls us back to him and says, I love you. I love you so much that I sent my son who died on a cross so that you could be redeemed. Our community helps us to see that. Our community helps us together as we grow to know that God loves us that much. I hope you've had a great retreat. I hope that this hasn't been too long of a video and that I haven't been a little too intense because I tend to be a little intense. But I hope that it was a good session for you. It made you think about some things and know and be assured of my prayers as you continue on today. May God bless you and all of you as you continue on this journey. God bless.